Analysts love you how Acorn simplifies their data pipelines with Rudderstack and DBT Labs. Uh, we've got three speakers with you here today. We've got Eric Dodds, Head of Product Marketing at Rudderstack, Faison Shabir, Senior Software Engineer at Acorns, and David Garay, also Senior Software Engineer at Acorns. And for everyone that is watching at home, as well as those of you that are joining us here in New Orleans, feel free to pop into uh, uh, our DBT Community Slack channel for this talk called Coalesce Make Analysts Love You. And everyone will be sticking around for a little bit after the talk to answer some questions. Uh, so if you, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, again to post them in the Slack channel during the talk, but if not, folks will be here afterwards to help you out. Uh, so yeah, with that, let's give a big round of applause to everyone here and join them on stage. Good afternoon, folks. Thank you for making it here. Um, as was said, this is the last talk of the sessions, but I promise an exciting story. Uh, as you can tell from the title of our talk, this will be a story filled with heroics, friendship, and love. <laughs> we're going to show the solution that we're currently building at Acorns to make funnel analytics uh, easier for, and, uh, for our data analyst teams. So before we go a little further, We'll do some introductions and some context setting. So yeah, my name is Faison Shabir, Staff Software Engineer at Acorns. I'm David Gray, Senior Software Engineer at Acorns. And I'm Eric Dodds, uh, I'm Head of Product Marketing at Rudderstack, and I'm actually gonna let these guys tell you all about Rudderstack, uh, but we love working with amazing teams and amazing uh, data people like Faison and David uh, to build cool stuff, and so they're gonna show you uh, what we've done. Awesome. Take it away, guys. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. And so for some context setting, uh, some of you may be wondering, what is Acorns? Uh, Acorns is where users can save, invest, and learn about their financial literacy in one app. Um, so we focus on building tools to make it easy for users to increase their savings and turn that into diversified investing for the long run. And we have a tradition at Acorns that whenever we present something, we always say our mission first to always remind ourselves and to ground us. So I'll go ahead and share that with you now. With benevolence and courage, we look after the financial best interests of the up and coming, beginning with the empowering proud step of micro-investing. So Acorns continues to grow and we've gone from just you know, rounding up from the nearest dollar and turning that into savings to investing to having Acorns later, which does IRAs and investments for retirements and to Acorns early, which has custodial accounts for your children and your family and even emergency fund savings and so on. Uh, but speaking of acorns, uh, why don't we have our favorite squirrel take over? Investing is not for everyone, right? Wrong. Wealth comes from pennies, like oaks come from acorns. Wealth comes from the decision to invest, to bury your acorns, give them time to grow into a mighty oak like squirrels do. And if a squirrel can be an investor, you can too. You see, investing was never meant to be an exclusive club. You just didn't have the right tools for it. Now you do. Acorns. Grow your own. Look at that. Beautiful. So now that you know what we do, we'll quickly cover the outline of this talk. So first we'll talk about the registration funnel problem that analytics faces, and then we'll give an architecture overview of our solution to that problem. Then we'll go ahead and start diving into that solution by talking our data landscape and show how we're capturing events with Rudderstack and how that is going into our data storage layer and how we can query those with Redshift and Databricks. And then we'll talk about how we're modeling this problem and how we're doing funnel analysis on DBT. So jumping right into the beginning of our heroic story, the data analyst team came to us and said, we need help with the registration funnel. And so why does this matter to Acorns? Well, Acorns is a subscription business primarily. So we monetize as users pay for our product, 
and different offerings belong to different price tiers. So you can start to see why it matters for us to see how users are registering. And it goes much more than just a user creating an account. In fact, it's important for us to see a user's entire onboarding experience and the conversion at each step of the funnel. So that helps us answer questions like, are users creating an account, but are they not subscribing to a particular tier? If, if users are creating an account and they have a tier, are they going ahead and investing their money? Because that's also a lost opportunity. Ultimately, it answers questions like, what's working in our funnel? What do we double down on? And what's not? But ultimately, this is a hard problem because of things such as like cross-platform action. So a user may start their journey in the browser and then end up in the iOS app. And David will talk more about that later. Um, or things like cohorting definitions, which is what, do, what events do we choose to count in our analysis and which ones do we not? So the analyst team did have an existing solution, but had several problems. The first was that data was in different data stores. Um, first and foremost, this increased runtime, but then also added code complexity and even mental overhead. So it kind of felt like you're trying to corral all the data and figure all this stuff out. The second was the solution was written as a very long notebook and it had sections of different languages. So you actually had SQL, Python, and Scala all in the same notebook. And it kind of felt like a little bit like you had to be counter Reeves and like read the matrix and like figure out what was going on. Um, it led to an experience where it was hard to discern what was upstream dependencies and even what were the events that powered that funnel. There was all that a repeated logic, things were tightly coupled and hard coded. And what this led to was that the only person that could effectively update funnel analysis was the person who wrote the notebook. And it didn't even give a place for data engineers to collaborate with data analysts. Like, hey, what do I do? Do I edit command five and you then edit command six? So we needed a, something that could do much better. And this kind of informed the requirements for our next solution. First being that we wanted a single interface. So we didn't want users to think about different data stores and just want to be able to query their data. Second, we need we needed to modularize the code and the data that powers it. And then we want to be able to find dependencies and downstream effects quickly. And then analysts should be able to create new events or new funnels and update their funnel event ordering easily. And then, of course, they want to be able to segment that funnel analysis based on sudden, certain, sudden, uh, certain attributes dynamically. So the so this is kind of the solution we came to with all those requirements. Uh, on the bottom, you can see we're capturing events from all those different platforms using Rudder Stack, and that's kind of ended up in our storage solution on S3, and we have Delta Lake with Databricks on top, and that's how we can query that. The analysts and data engineers are able to collaborate on DBT, and we have a modeling and funnel analysis solution that we'll talk about later, and we compute all that with Databricks, and the result is uh, visualizing Tableau. So we want to go into a little more detail. So on, for the bottom half of this picture, I'll go ahead and let David take over. Thanks, Faison. OK. So let's talk a little bit about RudderStack. We use RudderStack as a customer, uh, customer data platform, which gives us rich events across multiple platforms, web, iOS, and Android. Uh, with it, we can capture track screen events, container viewed and custom events, um, and it syncs to multiple destinations. Now, this is all handled through a web interface. It happens real time, streaming, and it's configurable. We get rich metadata payloads, which include uh, deeply nested JSON. Um, so one of the nice features is that it flattens the data and pushes it to the data lake automatically and iteratively. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Redshift and Databricks and how we've used them throughout our journey. So the Acorn's journey started with Redshift. We were trying to answer like one question very fast and effectively. The nice thing was it's always on. It's a SQL solution, so it's relatively easy to use, and it has fast query performance. But as our business scaled, the ETLs or ELTs got much more complex. So the nice thing about Databricks is that it's a true data lake, and we can do many questions in parallel. Uh, it also allows us to dynamically scale up and down because the compute and storage is decoupled and it's uh, very scalable, so provisions dynamically. Okay, so here's a weird migration path that we were stuck in for kind of years, I would say. <laughs> um, at the top, you can see there's an analyst writing notebooks, and they're writing notebooks in Databricks. Some of our data was in Redshift and some of it was in S3 or the Delta Lake. 
what would happen is that those queries would get queued up. And so it ended up being bursty. Whenever we were requesting data from Redshift, it could only answer one question at a time. When it was answering the question, it would have to load all that data into S3 to make it available to Databricks, which is also slow. And then we're joining that data against Delta Lake, which is not the ideal architecture. You could optimize this a little bit, but it requires a deeper understanding of kind of how the system works. So it's not ideal for exposing to analysts. So wait a second, Faison, I'm confused. Did we eliminate complexibility just to enable incomprehensibility? Well, I gave you an architecture diagram. You somehow added more boxes to the architecture diagram. So if you can show people how to remove that, that'd be great. All right. OK, so let's talk a little bit about Rudderstack to Databricks. In our first design iteration, we used this Redshift connector. It was a custom connector with custom DBT functionality. But uh, it was a little bit uh, slow and inefficient, as I mentioned before. So the second iteration, we were able to write directly to Databricks using the Databricks connector. We worked together with Rudderstack in order to optimize this. So what we noticed was, for their initial implementation, um, it was slow because it wasn't using partition pruning. So we gave them a sample query that showed them how to use partition pruning, and that optimized the process. So what is partition pruning? If you think about the way that um, a partition data is organized in Delta, it's essentially divided up into different directories based on the partition key. So for each date, in our case, it'll land in a different sort of subdirectory in S3. So imagine you're trying to merge into that, right? If you don't have a specific uh, if you don't have the, the optimizations in there, it'll try to look through all of the data in order to figure out where a record lies, as opposed to just choosing specific folders and telling it exactly where the data lands. And this is actually really important because most of the data that we're merging is real time, right? So it's only really focusing on one or two dates. So this release became ready mid-September, so just about a month ago. And now we have multiple sources connected to Databricks. We have the iOS, Android, and the web streams. Oh, and, and uh, sorry, let me back. So uh, more data is uh, real time now, so it's faster and cheaper. OK, so then we settled on our final architecture. As you can see, the analysts and data engineers are happily working side by side, because instead of some long matrixy, matrixy notebook, we have uh, modules that they're able to be developed independently. We're using more reusable code. So let's take a look at the top half of this picture now. DBT for models and funnels. Wait a second, Faison, did you put the fun in this? Funnels are supposed to be fun. As SpongeBob said about friendship, F is for friends who do stuff together, U is for you and me. Faison, stop it, no singing. <laughs> he does this during our team meetings. OK, let's talk a little bit about ID stitching. <clears throat> Who's ever had difficulty setting up an app for the first time? Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, so motivated by empathy for the user and our marketing team, quite frankly, we're trying to alleviate issues with the registration flow. So ID stitching. Basically, this is a problem that our analysts have solved several times, right? But they solve it as they're trying to solve other problems. Essentially, it's associating an anonymous ID with a real user ID. So before a user logs in, we want to tell the full journey. We need to stitch that all together. The thing is that the analysts aren't trying to solve this problem. So they kind of copy and paste the code. They do it over and over and over again, right? Um, and they're not doing it quite as deeply as somebody, who, a dedicated team that can do it from scratch. So Rutterstack offers this module that, that does the ID stitching for us. If you think about like a flow where a user browses to an ad, there's a cookie in a browser, they click through the ad, they get an email, they log in with a different device through the email, right? They may log in multiple times, um, trying to do something, finally set up the account, create a user ID. You wanna stitch that whole process together? That's essentially what this module does. This helps us troubleshoot leaky bucket issues. So we've been collaborating with Rudderstack to get the DBT module launched on, on Databricks to do ID stitching. All right, I'm going to hand it back over to Faison, who can do modularity modules. 
Cool, so going back to the requirements that we showed earlier, um, we wanted to flesh some more of those out to kind of inform us what the design of our model should be. The first requirement was that analysts should be able to map logged actions to semantic events. So what does that mean? Um, in Rudderstack, we're getting all these events, you know, such as container viewed, screen viewed, and they can be really highly granular. They can change across app versions. They can be different across platforms. And we want to be able to map these to easily understandable semantic events. So just making something up. So you have like screen viewed one, screen viewed two, viewed three, and all of that maps to create a count. And then we also want to be able to change funnel definitions and define new funnels and the order of those quickly. So to that end, we had two mapping models, one for events and one for funnels. And we did that using dbt seeds. So if you don't know what dbt seeds are, those are text files that can live in your project repository that you could use a model to materialize as a table. And then we also want an analyst to be able to segment funnels. Um, usually segmenting these funnel metric, cal metric calculations is based on attributes, often user-based. So we have a wide user table that does it with ID stitching and a bunch of attributes about like which marketing channel they came from and so on. And then, of course, the two main models that really matter is that we have the event stream model, which is a unified event stream model of basically your front events, back end events, and you have these unified attributes. And then each funnel is generated at its own model. And uh, the SQL code for that is generated dynamically, and I'll show you a little bit about that. So this is how our solution started to take place early on. On the top left, you can see these are all our rudder stack sources. We're pulling them in, creating staging tables. These are the mapping models using the Cs that I showed you. So you can see that we can take the mapping model and translate these events to our event stream. And this is what like a funnel mapping looks like, for example. It's really straightforward. So you have your funnel name, the semantic events that define that funnel, and the ordering of that. And then up here, we have the event stream and an example of a funnel. So the funnel is aggregating based on a cohorting definition using the funnel mapping on the event stream and generating the final metrics. So going back to fun, you know, how do we take a process that felt almost investigative, and that's not what the analysts wanted, they wanted, they wanted to do their actual investigation, they don't want to figure out what's going on in this notebook, to something that feels a lot more like this, or as I said before, F is for friends who do stuff together, Based use. On, no singing. <laughs> we focused on making it easy. That was the key for us. I already showed you defining new events and new funnels. It's very easy now with seed files. You literally just change a text file. Like it's designated for that purpose. There's no other place for you to go. And because of dbt, everything is automatically version controlled. So it's easy to see the changes. You have to be like, if somebody made a change in a notebook, how do I find out? And then we designed a macro. So every time you want to create a funnel, you basically are gonna call specific arguments, and I'll show you that. And now your SQL is generated for the model. And then in terms of applying segmentation, those are basically just column groups that you're gonna call into your macro. And in the future, we'll also make it so you can do different cohorting methods. Right now, we just have one cohorting method, but there will be need for more. And overall, with dbt, we really get a process where users can test out end-to-end -end funnels, right? So you can imagine, instead of just creating a new funnel, say they change the mapping for one event. They can see how it affects all the different funnels. They can generate that, see all those metrics, but they're not affecting their production, right? They're doing all of this end-to-end -end in their own development uh, environment. And they don't also have to rewrite a bunch of code, meaning copy-paste from that notebook. So here's an example. You see, I'm calling this macro here. I have to save the file while we're waiting for that. Is it pronounced GIF or JIF? We'll never know. The rage, the debate will always rage on. Um, Awesome, so it compiles, and as it compiles, you'll see there's a bunch of SQL that shows up. So this will run every time the model is run. Um, you can see you know, we're joining with our event stream, our users, and our funnel mapping. So let's look at this macro in more detail. The first thing we're calling is the funnel name. So this has to match the text exactly as it was in funnel mapping, and it gives us the set of events and the ordering we wanna do. Second is the name of the semantic event. So right now we have one cohorting definition. How that's working is you basically give us the event and we apply that as like a pivot point. And anything that's happening from there, it's almost sessionized. If you're doing the next set of events within a certain period of time, we're gonna count that as part of the funnel metric analysis. 
And then you tell us what dimensionality you want to go ahead and segment these funnel by, uh, funnels and do the analysis by. So this is like first client platform. You might want to do by a marketing channel, designated market area, so on. So overall, with all of these things that I showed you earlier, we're able to take a developer experience and make it much nicer. So we go from a runtime that had the complexity of three hours now down to 15 minutes because things are modularized. Uh, we're not doing joins across different data stores. And overall, we're able to give analysts a funnel almost playground. They're able to test out, do a bunch of different changes, and feel safe doing that. Everything is version controlled. Uh, because things are modular, we can test things individually as well. Um, a lot of times, we don't have to write those tests even because DBT utils offer so many useful functionalities. And overall, we're in a world where data engineering and data analysts continue to be like almost best of friends. You're not an analyst. Don't, don't touch me. I'm sorry. I just carried away, get carried away. It's so beautiful. So this is a quote from one of our analytics managers that the new approach through DBT uh, has made funnel reporting much more flexible, efficient, and robust. And it's letting us uncover areas of high importance, impact, and opportunities much more easily. So overall, thank you folks. Um, Acorns is hiring. Hopefully we've convinced us, you with our amazing jokes how fun it is to work with us. <laughs> At any given time, uh, you can always reach out to us on LinkedIn or talk to us afterwards if you're interested. Um, I did want to link some resources. So for funnel design, we had a great article, and I thought this might be useful for other people. Um, I have a link also to the Rudderstack DBT modules, including the ID stitching module. And there's a funnel analysis module that we didn't use, but I think other people may find it useful. Um, so that's it, folks. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out.